The bloke is back, back sitting on the front benches today. Three times Ken Clark tried to lead the Tories. Three times they slammed the door in his face. Proof that in an economic crisis, political parties really can bury their past. The time has come to stop enjoying myself on the back benches and get down to contributing, to preparing for government, really. Very intelligent, very articulate, and convinced he was right. Pint in one hand, big fat cigar in the other hand, especially if there's a no smoking sign over his shoulder. Cheerful, rumbustious, opinionated, full of life. Immensely self-confident, arrogantly so actually, but because he has charm, like Dennis Healy, he gets away with it. I was the only person who'd asked him to be his best man, whose mother-in-law hadn't vetoed the proposition. Kenneth Harry Clark, son of a Nottingham watchmaker who won a scholarship to his local public school and place at Cambridge. There he met five future cabinet ministers. He fell out with one when he invited Oswald Mosley to speak to the University Conservative Association. I did object to the notion that Oswald Mosley's visit should become an annual event, and so I resigned from the committee of CUCA. We stood against each other for the secretaryship of the union um, in a hotly contested uh, election. Um, so that was, the, that was the, I suppose, the first moment of uh, competitive rivalry. While studying, Clark also embarked upon another relationship that would last him a lifetime. I do remember the occasional emotional outburst. If uh, student board games went on for hours on end, she would uh, certainly uh, coax him away fairly emphatically. I don't think I can remember them exchanging crosswords, really, but she, she, no, she can certainly um, circumscribe his activities if she's so minded. Yes, absolutely. Clark had a speedy political rise. In Parliament by 29, he became a whip in Ted Heath's government two years later. But Margaret Thatcher would apply the brakes to his career. Ken took until about 1985 or 86 to get cabinet rank, and that was demonstrably unfair. And the reason for that uh, was that uh, Clark was, A, not to uh, ideological taste. Uh, you know, he wasn't a swivel-eyed free marketeer. Uh, and B, he was a powerful character and a powerful political personality. She was smart enough to see she couldn't promote him too soon. He'd give her trouble. But when he finally got into Cabinet, he proved himself an effective minister. I remember going into the Department of Trade and Industry and talking to my predecessor on the first day. He wanted to give me some advice and said, you know, every Secretary of State coming into Trade and Industry, um, they, you know... They've got the problem of regional policy, shipbuilding, rover and British steel. And they all try and sort them out and they all fail and you'll fail too. And within a year, they privatised British steel, they privatised British shipbuilding and sold rover. Promoted to health secretary, Clark revolutionised the NHS, introducing the internal market and gained a reputation for liking a fight. I think he was um, one of the great reforming ministers of the Thatcher government. He played a huge part in um, reforming both health and education. Um, he, he certainly wasn't um, shy of a battle or two. Clark has never let high office stop him enjoying himself. He likes late nights listening to jazz. How long are you staying tonight? Uh, half eight Ministry of Defence today tomorrow. You're there later on, eh? Uh, one o'clock. And days out bird watching. I am told that they were on holiday in, in uh, Cornwall once and uh, Ken saw a bird and said, no, I said, Jane, what on earth is that beautiful bird? And she said, Ken, really? You see those in the garden at home in Birmingham. It's a blue tit. Margaret Thatcher's departure from Downing Street came after she called on her cabinet to back her. The fatal night after she had beaten Heseltine but not powerfully enough, we were all tired. I'd been running the front page leave for the best part of a fortnight and it went on for another fortnight. I went home at nine or ten o'clock early in those days and um, 
because I'd heard she was seeing the cabinet one by one, and I thought, one by one, she'll break them. Uh, but in fact, one by one, they said, no, Margaret, it won't go. We'll support you, but you'll lose. Some of them wept, it is said. Uh, Ken didn't weep, of course, he's not the weepy type, but he told her, and you would have expected him to do it. Well, Ken, um, I think he's made no secret of the fact, thought that her time had come and, and that it was, it was time for her to go. John Major's honeymoon was short-lived. The pound's ejection from the European exchange rate mechanism divided his cabinet. In a way, one of the most dramatic arguments we had was immediately after we um, came out of the ERM when um, there was a big argument in Cabinet about whether the statement that was made in the House of Commons that afternoon should say we wanted to re-enter the ERM at the earliest opportunity. Major sent Clark to the Treasury. He would captain the British economy to sunnier waters. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, a politician presenting his first budget is rather like a lion tamer trying out his act for the first time. But even that couldn't save the Tories from disaster. Mr Clark offered himself as the leader capable of attracting back to the party the millions of voters who switched to Labour and the Liberal Democrats. Crushing election defeat. Ken Clark's leadership campaign's complete shambles. Wouldn't do the necessary spade work, not a team man in that sense. In many ways, he resembles Dennis Healy, another loner, another take me as you find me or you can all go and get lost. Despite the defeats, David Cameron needs Ken Clark. <laughs> well, I think you're going to have to get the snapper to go away. With a Tory victory likely, soon he could be back in the driving seat.